In this video, we're going to be diving into different architectures and representations for modeling atoms with graph neural networks. We're going to begin by talking about a family of models that we describe as invariant. If you're curious about equivariant models, that'll be the next video. But before we do that, let's talk about a naive approach to modeling atoms. And this is the approach that I took when I first looked, started looking at this problem. You might think that a good representation for modeling atoms is a 3D grid. There are a bunch of 3D points, right? But if we create a 3D grid, there's actually a problem. So if we look back at the potential energy surface that we showed in one of our earlier videos, we can see that if the atoms are far apart, the potential energy changes very slowly. So this is good. We could have a fairly coarse grid, and it could represent these atom interactions probably pretty well. But the problem is, is that as the atoms get closer together, the potential energy increases really dramatically. So what this means, that if the atoms are close to each other and they move just a little bit, is that the forces and the energy of the overall system could change very dramatically. And this becomes a problem if you want to use a 3D grid, because it means that the 3D grid would have to have really high resolution. And if you have too much resolution and you know there's too many grid cells, is computationally or just the memory of the GPU is going to be too expensive to store. So in general, we don't want to use 3D grids so what are some other representations we could use? Well, they basically fall into two camps. One is invariant representations, and the other one is equivariant representations. If a model has invariant representations, this implies that the internal representation of the model does not change when the input is transformed, such as rotating the system of atoms. In equivariant models, the internal representation transforms according to that transformation. And we'll get more into this in our next video. So let's start by talking about invariant representations because they're you know, a little bit easier. If we rotate the system of atoms, the internal representation of an invariant neural network won't change, which results in the output not changing as well. In contrast, if we just trained a vanilla neural network using the atom positions directly, it won't know the changes in positions were due just to a rotation, and the outputs would not remain constant. One simple way to resolve this is to train a neural network that just looks at the distances between the atoms. And you can see how this is not going to change as the atoms rotate, as you can see here. One early and popular model that uses only distance information is Chenet. It encodes the distance between atoms using a continuous embedding and passes it through a neural network. A few examples of the weights it learns as a function of distance is shown here. Now the problem with only using distance is that during each message passing update, you only know the distances between the atoms. And this configuration of atoms would look identical to let's say this configuration of atoms for that node update. So you're basically leaving a lot of information on the table. Well, one thing that we could pass a network is the angle between neighboring atoms. Here is shown as theta. And this is important because as we showed in one of the other videos, we could have, let's say, a CO2 molecule, let's uh, two oxygens on either side of the carbon, and we would think that a water molecule would look similar. But as we know, a water molecule doesn't look like that. It looks like this with the Mickey Mouse suitors. So one of the most popular papers that uses this angular information is called DimeNet. And what they did is they created triplets of atoms where one of the atoms would be the target atom and the other two would be a pair from the neighboring atoms. And each of these triplets would have an embedding that it would compute from the angular information. And then when it wanted to update the edge information, it would sum up all of the triplets corresponding to that edge and use that as an input to update the edge embedding as well. So you might think that this is sufficient information now to model your entire atomic structure. But that's actually not the case. Let's say you have a system of atoms like this, where you have four different atoms with two different angles. But you could have another structure with four different atoms, which has the same exact angles, but has it a different overall structure. So this final angular information that you need to store is something called the dihedral angle. And you compute the dihedral angle by basically uh, aligning all of the atoms along the axis of the red and the dark gray atom here, and then taking the angle between the light gray and the blue atom. One example approach that uses dihedral angles is called GemNet, where they computed an embedding for every quadruplet of atoms. Now let's summarize how these invariant models work. First, you compute an embedding for every quadruplet of atoms using the dihedral angles. Next, you compute the triplet embeddings using the angular information and the sum of the quadruplet embeddings for which the triplet is a subset. Next, the edge embeddings are computed using distance information and the sum of the embeddings from triplets from which the edge is a member. 
And finally, we compute the node embeddings using the edge embeddings that are connected to that node. And finally, all those embeddings are passed to the next layer to then iteratively update all of the embeddings at each update step. So one thing just to draw attention to is if we have edge embeddings, which are based upon distances, is that is going to be order n squared. If we look at every triplet of atoms, and we look at the angles associated with those triplets, that's going to be order n cubed. And if we look at dihedral angles, that's going to be order n to the fourth. So these methods can be quite expensive. And in practice, the number of, let's say, dihedral angles that we're considering is only like the closest, closest neighbors to an atom, where you might in increase that neighborhood when you start looking at triplets, and maybe even increase your neighborhood farther when you look at distances. So there's a bunch of different tricks you can play with this. And if you look at the GemNet paper, or the GemNet OC paper, you can see uh, how these different trade-offs are made. At this point, I want to take a step back and talk a bit about how we compute forces, because I know this is something that can be a bit confusing. But before we talk about how we compute the forces, what are the forces themselves? Well, the forces are just a derivative of the energy with respect to the atom positions. So let's look at a simple example where we just have you know, two atoms. If the atoms are far apart and we look at their potential energy, the potential energy isn't going to change very much as you move the atoms back and forth. And what this implies is that the attractive forces between the atoms is fairly weak. Now, if we move the atoms closer together, what we see is that the potential energy uh, derivative becomes much higher. And this implies that the atoms are going to be strongly attracted to each other. Now, if we move the atoms even closer together, then what we see is a really negative derivative, and this implies that there's a really strong repulsive force between the two atoms. So hopefully here you can see how there's a relationship between the energy and its derivative and the forces that we expect. So how do we actually compute the forces with our graph neural network? Well, with a graph neural network, we take the atom positions and their atomic numbers, and then we feed them through the graph neural network to compute our energy. So how can we take the derivative? Well, taking a step back, let's look at how we actually train that network. We use something called backpropagation. So what is backpropagation? Well, what it does is it takes the loss, the error bound, and it computes how much is that error going to vary based upon changing the different weights. So you can think about that as if I wiggle this weight back and forth a little bit, you know, make it a little bit higher, make it a little bit lower, how much is that going to impact the output of the neural network? So this is essentially the same thing that we want to do for atom positions. So if we just back propagate one more step to the atom positions, we can determine if we move that atom back and forth by just a little bit, how is that going to impact the energy, which is exactly the gradient that we're looking for. This describes how we can use backpropagation to compute our forces using the gradient-based approach. But as we described before, there's actually two different ways you compute the forces. One is using the gradient approach, and the other one is using a direct approach, where you just directly estimate the forces. So one thing that you might be wondering, and if you're paying close attention, is how can we use a direct approach to compute forces, which should vary if you rotate the system, because the forces should rotate as well, using a representation that is invariant to rotations. It doesn't seem to make any sense. How can we do this? So the way we do it is we don't just compute a node embedding. We also compute edge embeddings. And for each edge embedding, we can compute a scalar value. And then what we do is we multiply that scalar value times the direction of that edge, and we add that together for all possible edges. And this is going to be our funnel force estimation. So by using the edges, which have this directional information, we can then compute a equivariant quantity such as forces. Now that we've covered invariant representations, in our next video, we're going to be diving into equivariant representations. And this is one of my favorite parts, because we get to talk about spherical harmonics and some of the fun mathematics behind it. We'll see you there.